today about as you just heard, we're now recording the meeting. So um, I'm, my name is Nicola Miller. I'm the director of the Institute of Advanced Studies at UCL, and we're delighted to be co-hosting this event this evening with the Institute of the Americas, also based at UCL. So we're going to be talking today about the effects uh, on women and girls and uh, LGBTQ people in Latin America of the COVID-19 pandemic and the way that it's been managed in a whole range of countries. And our discussion will draw upon a really remarkable piece of work that's being carried out um, at the United Nations by the United UN Development Programme and UN Women, um, which has been tracking across the, across the globe uh, the effects of the pandemic uh, in gender terms. So we'll have six presentations for you tonight. Um, the first half of the evening will be talking about the COVID-19 uh, tracker and uh, its general and comparative implications, its methodologies as well. And then the second part will look at some individual country case studies. We have people talking about uh, Brazil, Argentina and Chile. So as there's quite a range of presentations, after each uh, of them, we'll open up a little bit of time if you would like to ask any questions specifically uh, of that speaker. But if you have more general questions, there'll, there'll be some time at the end for you to raise those. Please do write your questions in the chat, then I can see them and raise them and put them to the speakers. Uh, other than that, I just ask you please to keep your um, both your video and your microphone turned off at all times because there have been rather a lot of problems with bandwidth this afternoon and we want to make sure we don't get any breakdowns in coverage to you. So I will now hand over um, to open our event to Maxine Molina. She's Professor of Sociology at the Institute of the Americas at UCL and she's been very much involved in this project and she's going to introduce it to you. Maxine. You're on mute, I think, Maxine. Sorry. I shouldn't have been. Okay, thank you, Silke. Um, thanks so much, Nicola, and um, hello, everyone. I'm going to give a little bit of background to this discussion, but before that, I want to say how delighted I am that the Institute of the Americas at UCL and the Institute of Advanced Studies are able to host this great event to launch the COVID gender policy tracker created by UN Women and UNDP. It's a tremendously important development and I congratulate Silke and Constanza and, her, and their colleagues for their hard work in getting such an enormous amount of data together on government policy responses. Not an easy matter at the best of times. To some background then, uh, as is well known, the Latin American and Caribbean region has been very hard hit by the health crisis created by the COVID pandemic. Almost half a million people have died and infection rates are out of control in a range of countries despite early lockdowns in some. The hardest hit are Brazil with 166,000 dead, Mexico with almost 100,000. The next group, Argentina, Peru and Colombia, all have around 35,000 dead. These are terrifying figures and you can go down the list and see how seriously individual countries are on the various uh, sites that display this um, data. The economic and social effects of the pandemic are also extremely worrying, with many of the gains in poverty reduction and human rights over recent decades disappearing or threatened. Latin American societies suffer from very marked inequalities and the region's economies were not doing well economically before the pandemic and regional health and education systems left much to be desired. Current UN projections for most states across the region are of negative growth rates and high debt repayments for many years to come, which means that existing social deficits will remain unaddressed at best and in many cases will increase. Turning to the gender dimensions of the crisis, well, we know a fair amount about the gendered effects of the pandemic and about how women are paying a particularly heavy price in income and job security 
intimate partner violence, greater pressures on the care economy, deteriorating access to health services, including and importantly, those associated with fertility control. These trends are global as well as regional, but there is less discussion about the reasons why women are so vulnerable to these effects and especially about what policy measures are necessary to respond to them. Now, Latin America has a comparatively good record on women's rights in the so-called global south. And thanks to active women's movements and women-friendly policymakers, there has been significant progress on several fronts. Family law, political representation, feminicide law are examples, but a critical foundation of gender inequality remains relatively unassailed, namely the social division of labor, which assigns women to the roles of primary carer and homemaker, while in the labor force, their work lacks the status, pay and recognition of men's. These two facts are of course mutually reinforcing and sanctioned by cultural norms that are only slowly changing among a portion of the population. As everywhere, COVID has cruelly expo exposed the fault lines of the societies it's ravaging. Millions of people have lost their lives who might have been saved with more social investment, better healthcare, income support, and one has to say, PPE. Many more people have lost their incomes and those in precarious and low paid em employment, many of whom are women, are struggling to make it through each day as the tension between being a primary carer and an income earner grows ever more acute and as essential services come under intense pressure or close entirely during lockdowns. As the COVID gender tracker shows, Latin American governments are responding, if unevenly, to some of these effects, sometimes under pressure from active women's movements, some of which are also doing invaluable grassroots work within communities, whether to keep services open, offer hotline support for domestic violence, or distribute basic essentials, including the day after pill to women in need. A question that we do not yet have firm answers to is why some governments have responded with women-friendly policies and others have not. And there are many surprises in the mix that are not entirely to do with resources. Success is, however, often due to states having well-established, securely institutionalized commitments to gender equality agendas, often pushed through by female politicians in alliance with women's movements and other civil society actors. And states that have maintained commitments to social investment have also been able to respond better for obvious reasons. So to hear more about these responses, we'll hear from our contributors and I'm delighted to hand over to our two speakers from UN Women, Constanza Tabush and Silke Stav, to hear what their new tracker tool can tell us about how states have responded to women's needs in this extraordinarily difficult time. Constanza and Silke work in the research and data section of UN Women and they led on the conceptual and methodological development of the tracker. So happy to say over to them. Thank you, Maxime. And let me first start by thanking UCL Institute of the Americas, the Institute of Advanced Studies, the whole team behind the scene, the scenes, Maxine, Nicola, Oscar, for organizing this wonderful webinar where we will have the opportunity to discuss and present some of the key findings of our new uh, global gender response tracker. So as Maxine very eloquently summarized the pandemic, we all know has all kinds of gender implications and has taken a huge toll on women. So how are governments around the world rising to this challenge? What measures in particular are they taking to confront the surge in violence against women, strengthen women's economic security and address unpaid care? To answer these three critical questions, UN Women and UNDP have put together the Global COVID-19 um, Gender Response Tracker. In it, uh, we have compiled and analyzed around 2,500 um, 2, policy measures across 206 countries and territories. 
and we have made every effort to ensure that the tracker is comprehensive as possible. But as you might all imagine, we are kind of following a moving target at a global uh, scale, so that has its limitations as well. The tracker, therefore, um, is a living platform, and we are striving to improve it with the help of our partners, um, including member states, uh, civil society, and academia as well. So we are here today to share some of the emerging trends we have identified so far. So if we move on to the global picture, just to give you an idea where the region stands. Next slide, please. Globally, we have identified a total of 992 gender sensitive measures, combining those that address violence against women, unpaid care and women's economic security. And with a total of 261 measures, Latin America and the Caribbean is the region with the second highest number of measures, as you can see in the graph. Likewise, Latin America and the Caribbean also stands out uh, as the developing region with the largest number of countries that have adopted uh, what we call a holistic response, meaning that they have measures spanning all three areas we looked at, violence, women's economic security, and unpaid care. So a comparatively positive story, but there are, of course, important gaps um, in this response, and we will turn to those in a minute. So if we look at the now at the regional picture um, with Perfect. So we'll look at the composition of the gender response within the region. So out of the 261 gender sensitive measures taken across 33 countries in the region, more than two thirds focus on stepping up action on violence against women. And this is heartening and also as Maxine noted, likely a reflection of the longstanding and strong advocacy of women's movements on this issue. In comparison, uh, as you can see in the graph, fewer efforts have been identified uh, that target women's economic security or address unpaid care with 61 and 23 measures respectively. And this is an important gap that we will um, turn to in a minute. Um, before, we'll give you an idea of what we've seen um, with regards to the violence response. So, if we take a closer look here, we see that uh, measures that governments have taken to respond to the rise in violence against women mostly focus on strengthening services for women and survivors, followed by awareness raising campaigns. So for example, just to give you a flavor of the different kinds of measures, in the Dominican Republic, for instance, shelters for survivors of violence have been declared essential services and remain open. 24 seven during lockdown. Whereas in Bolivia, Chile and Colombia, as well as some other countries, women can report violence and seek help in pharmacies, usually using a keyword that alerts pharmacy staff of the situation. So while we see an array of different measures across different countries, yet only six countries have actually mainstream violence against women into their COVID response by integrating it into national and lo local response plans. And this is an important gap that requires urgent attention. So with this, I hand over to Silke. Thank you, Connie, and hello, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. I will continue if it lets me advance the slide with another aspect of the COVID-19 response that we looked at as part of this project, which are social protection and labor market policies. And we took um, more of a gender mainstreaming approach to this, um, to this uh, dimension, if you like. So we worked with a pretty large data set globally of 1,300 measures, social protection and labor market measures that we then looked at through a gender perspective. 339 of these measures were in Latin America and the Caribbean, and to determine um, the extent to which these measures address gender-specific risks and vulnerabilities, we asked two basic questions. 
One, does the measure aim to reduce women's economic insecurity, for example, by targeting them with cash transfers or in-kind support? And two, does the measure support unpaid care and address the rising demand for unpaid care in the context of lockdowns? For example, by providing leaves for workers with, with family responsibilities or by keeping childcare services open um, during shutdowns. The findings are um, quite sobering, but I think in line with what kind of one perceives um, also at the country level, particularly when it comes to unpaid care. Um, in terms of measures that address uh, target women's economic security, we see that roughly 15% of these over 330 social protection labor market measures do so. And while this is clearly not sufficient, it is higher than what we found for the global average, meaning that Latin America is doing comparatively better in this area than, than, than most other regions. We think that this is um, not a coincidence um, and builds on the region's efforts to strengthen social protection systems over the past two decades. Um, in fact, one of the most widespread measures um, that supports women's economic security during this crisis has been the extension of cash transfer programs. And countries that had heavily invested in these programs prior to the pandemic were able to scale up support relatively quickly by either providing extra payments to women who were already among the recipients, as for example, in the case of Colombia's Familias en Acción, or and or by reaching out to new groups um, that were not previously covered, um, including, for example, domestic workers, as has been the case in Argentina. Um, when it comes to unpaid care and contrast, um, that you know, we can see it remains a much neglected area with only 7% of social protection and labor market measures in the region addressing this issue, which is, I think, slightly lower than, than the global average. But the global average is also just to, um, just to say that quite dominated by the response in, in the developed countries. So I'm um, looking a bit closer at what kind of measures um, countries have taken when it comes to unpaid care. We see that overall only 12 countries in the region have taken such, um, such me measures out of 43. We're talking about Latin America and the Caribbean here. Um, and these 23 measures fall into three broad categories. Um, one category is social protection comprising both social insurance measures and social assistance measures. And the former includes, for example, expanded family leave provisions for workers with family responsibilities. Chile is one example where extensions of up to 90 days were granted to parents on parental leave for the duration of the lockdown. The second category of care related measures are labor market measures and include things like shorter or flexible work arrangements, additional wage subsidies for working parents and so on. So for example, in Bolivia, parents were allowed to reduce working hours for COVID-19 related family care. Um, but while these measures obviously signal an important recognition of unpaid care responsibilities, um, their reach, um, of course, particularly of the social assistance measures, but also some of the labor market measures that are very centered on formal sector employment remains limited in a region where informal employment is really quite pervasive. Um, and so fairly little attention has been paid to the third category. So care services and schools included um, were and in most countries remain shut even as, as lockdowns are eased. One exception is Costa Rica, um, which maintained its public network of daycare centers open during the lockdown to serve um, children of essential workers, which is obviously an important, um, important measure. So that's, um, that was an, a rough overview of, of the information contained in the tracker, but there's really much more to it and we encourage you all to check it out with the link on the next slide. Sorry. I had, sorry, I had a, an, an interference. Um, we also believe that um, the tracker holds important potential for further research and analysis and so wanted to end with three ideas along these lines. 
Um, first, the tracker looks at announced policy measures, policy measures that are implemented, but analyzes them on a policy de design level. But we know that many programs that look good on paper um, then run into difficulties during implementation. So for example, they may not be adequately funded and, and there are often also bottlenecks and unintended consequences in delivery. And um, I believe we'll hear a bit more about this from Bila um, in her presentation on Brazil. Second, the tracker looks at government measures, but we also know that the community-based response has played a major role um, during the pandemic. And um, we're looking forward to hearing a bit more from Eleanor and Paola on this. Um, for the cases of Argentina and Chile, respectively. And finally, picking up, and I'll end there, um, on Maxine's remarks at the beginning, um, some countries seem to have a stronger gender response than others, begging the question of um, why this is the case. Um, I'm afraid we don't have answers yet, but we do have some hunches, and I've put some questions here. Does government ideology matter, for example? Does women's presence in decision-making make a difference? And if so, in which institutions? For example, do we see a better response in countries with strategic partnerships between autonomous women's movements, women politicians, and feminist bureaucrats? And our hunch is that this may be the case for Argentina, for example. And then finally, um, what role do policy legacies play um, in Brazil, for example, and, and again, yeah. Bila say more about this, um, a massive expansion of cash transfers was pushed through by the opposition um, in Congress, certainly building on the legacy of Bolsa Familia and other um, programs from the Lula and Dilma years. So, I'll end here, and I'm really looking forward to hearing more um, from other panelists, including um, Jasmine, who will look at um, the health response in the region, which is an important dimension that we haven't covered um, in the tracker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Constanza and Silke, um, for that great introduction to the tracker. You can see if you open the chat that Constanza has kindly put in the links for you so you can go and look for yourself um, at some of their findings. If there are any questions to Constanza and Silva, please put them in the, in the chat now. One thing I was wondering particularly, I don't know, I don't know if you can answer this, but you, you broke down the, the Latin American and Caribbean uh, data uh, by the different areas of policy, violence and, and security and, and unpaid care. But I was also wondering how um, the, the policies are distributed across different countries, whether there's a few countries that have a high number of gender sensitive policies and uh, other countries that have very few or whether it's fairly evenly distributed across the across the region. Constanza or Silke, are you able to answer that? You're on mute. Yeah. Oh, moment. okay, okay. I thought we were waiting for uh, after Jasmine. Okay, yes, well, we can certainly do that now. Um, I think one of the key. Um, we had this, we use these two different measures, like number of measures and number of countries that help you cut the data in different ways. Mm. Uh, when it comes to the distribution within the region, um, one thing we've noted is the difference be uh, between the Caribbean countries and the Latin American ones. So that's like quite a distinction in terms of not only number of countries with measures, but also number of measures per country. So I think that will be the biggest distinction uh, that we've seen. So a bigger amount of countries with measures as well as measures mm -hmm. uh, within the Latin American countries in contrast with the Caribbean ones. Um, right, that's very interesting. Yeah, okay, yeah. thank you. Does anybody else have any questions they'd like to raise? I guess maybe they're going to develop as we have more information. So let's move now to our second speaker, uh, who's going to cover the whole area, um, Jasmine Gideon from Birkbeck in the University of London, uh, is going to talk about health and gender in the COVID response overall. So Jasmine, I hand over to you. Hello. Um, 
And uh, yes, thank you very much, Nicola. And I would like to thank Constanza, Silke and Maxine for inviting me to speak today. And again, the rest of the team for facilitating everything, in, including um, the slides, etc. cetera. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the health system, not so much about the sort of specifics of the response, but about um, why it's important to maintain a, a gendered analysis of the health system, because while there's been a lot of um, attention on the gendered dimensions of COVID in terms of whether men or women are, are more likely to get COVID or are more likely to die from it, I think there's uh, the kind of broader gender dimensions of health and health systems have, have been overlooked. And again, while there's been perhaps more amongst feminists, some discussion of whether um, sexual reproductive health services have been uh, marginalised as a response um, to the kind of focus on COVID. Again, there's there's not much discussion of, of other dimensions of the health system from a gender perspective. And it seems that unlike um, the UNDP and UN Women's Initiative here, that um, PAHO has been less able to kind of draw together a coordinated response across the region. It, it, it seems that's not really happened in the same way. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to just um, give a very brief overview and really um, a kind of theoretical framework, at which I'm going to illustrate with examples of, of the Peruvian case. But I would argue that the kind of questions I'm posing can equally be um, be applicable in other country contexts. So could I have the next slide, please. So I'm arguing that, you know, we can draw parallels across the region because there are parallels in the kind of health systems in, in most of the region, that they, these are health systems characterized by segmentation and fragmentation, as in you have this public and private system working side by side, but not necessarily interconnected. Uh, there's fragmentation in terms of um, a lack of coordination in across sectors, etc. That there are also strong colonial legacies and patriarchal gendered norms deeply embedded within these systems, and that on the whole across the region, women are more likely to be in the public sector, while men are more likely to own private health insurance plans, which women are then covered by, but they don't hold them in their own name. They have they access them through their male um, partners. The, the um, health sector is a very female intensive sector in terms of employment. So 73% of, of staff employed across the region's health sectors are women but also out-of-pocket payments, so payments that people make from their own households on health is, is very high, so 34% of total health spending across the region comes from out-of-pocket payments, and I'll come back to this uh, later on. And as I said, I'm going to illustrate my argument with um, examples from Peru. So next slide, please. So just very quickly, for those of you not familiar with the Peruvian health system, uh, around 60% of the health uh, of the population are covered by the public sector and 30% are covered by uh, social health insurance, so e-salud, which is for people on very low incomes, and 10% are covered by the armed forces, national police and the private sector. So the private sector is fairly um, low key in Peru, but it is still there. And and I th think in terms of the kind of um, the fragmentation and who gets access to what in the context of COVID, there are very kind of marked differences between the two sectors. Um, but what's important, and um, moving on to the next slide, please, is that um, in this context, that women are much more likely to be in CIS, so the social health insurance, and uh, men in e -salud, where which is determined, uh, access is determined by income. But again, as I've said already, there's a very strong gendered and racialized historical legacy in the health system. And in the Peruvian context, this is further aggravated by the civil conflict. And this is evident in the health and in, in health um, outcomes, but the health system. And this plays out in terms of access to and experiences of healthcare that are shaped by social identity, particularly gender, race, class, age, and locality. And again, in Peru, we know that um, rural health systems are incredibly underdeveloped in comparison to urban systems. And again, over 
um, for summer in the UK and the media here, we saw lots of um, images coming out of the, um, uh, uh, the, the Peruvian Amazon region and the kind of stark inequalities that were happening amongst populations there. And again, I'm sure people are, um, are familiar with these kind of issues. And so very much kind of framed around ethnicity, race, etc. And that we know that um, it, it's frequently um, women and racialized women that are most likely to lack access. And even when they do have access, they are frequently poorly treated within health systems. And again, evidence suggests that women rather than men are more likely to be sort of seen as indigenous in terms of the way they're treated by healthcare professionals. Um, and, and this kind of frames the way in which they experience the health system. And of course, in the context of COVID, that's extremely important. Okay, next slide, please. Um, again, pre-COVID, the health system in Peru was already highly, um, of extremely fragile. For example, uh, a research in, from, the, from a state study, state analysis in 2018 highlighted that 43% of health facilities in the, in the research did not have sufficient human resources. And one of the issues in Peru is because a lot of attention had been given to meeting the MDGs and the SDGs, that a lot of investment has gone into um, improving maternal and child health, which is of course a very um, important field, but at the expense of other aspects of health. And so what you see is that there are a large number of doctors and nurses um, who work in that specific field, but not in other areas. So other areas of the health system are incredibly under-resourced. And, um, and again, I think, you know, in the context of COVID, these kind of inequalities um, are, are very starkly evident. Okay, next slide, please. So um, more specifically from a gender perspective, one of the um, key issues is that the um, health sector itself is a very highly gendered structure. There's a very gendered hierarchy in, in the health sector in Peru. And I think, again, this is commonly found not just in Latin America, but across the world. But in the Peruvian case, 74% of physicians were male, older, more experienced and more likely to be trained in a clinical speciality, whereas the majority of nursing staff are, are female and only 8% of, of nursing staff in Peru are, are male. And again, evidence shows that there's a significant gender gap in wages in the health sector and even um, the, the, the few female doctors that there are, few health professionals, they have less access to training and other non-monetary benefits compared to men. And even though there has been a professionalization of nursing, um, gender gaps in education mean that women are less likely to be highly educated than men. And there's also a class and racialized dimension to this. So again, this has implications for those moving into areas of specialism, for example. And again, um, in the private sector in particular, there's large numbers of nursing auxiliaries. But again, these tend to be predominantly female, less educated and less well paid. And again, you know, Maxine and Silke and uh, Connie have already raised the issue about access to PPE, um, but also, you know, many of these women working in the health sector are also um, mothers, carers for their own families. And the, the, the kind of cost of this in terms of um, unpaid care is, is clearly significant. And that within the health system, female nurses are already much more likely to to multitask compared to male health professionals and that it's sort of seen as part of you know women's ability to do all this work um, and uh, and again there's there's evidence coming out that uh, female nurses and again not just in in Peru but more broadly are more likely to suffer stress and particularly of course these kind of issues are highly exacerbated in the context of COVID. Uh, next slide please. Um, and I think it's important that we also look at households, not just as consumers of care, which I'll talk about in a moment, but as producers of health care. So coming back to this issue of unpaid care work that has al already been raised, we know about the gender division of labour within in households um, and evidence from Peru shows very clearly that 
women rather than men take prime responsibility for um, unpaid care work. I should add that these um, time use studies, this data here is pre-COVID. So I think, again, we need to kind of look and question the data and, you know, what, what might it look like now in the context of COVID when schools continue to be closed, et cetera, et cetera. And again, we know there's variations between income groups and low women, sorry, low income women do um, most of the unpaid care work. And in a Peruvian context, hospitals have been refusing to accept older COVID patients. So again, this raises the question of, you know, who's looking after these, these people and um, presumably that, that burden falls on, on women in particular. So again, increasing their unpaid care work and again, you know, this has got implications for women, regardless of what sector they work in. But, you know, in the context of COVID, it's particularly important to think about uh, those women working in the health sector who are also taking on greater unpaid care work burdens in the home. And of course, uh, significant divides in terms of rural and urban areas, in terms of access to social infrastructure, including clean water. So again, other, um, other means of stressing the amount of time pressure placed on women to be able to perform their unpaid care work in the context of COVID. Uh, next slide, please. And um, again, it's important to think of households as consumers of healthcare. So um, we know that Peru is a country where the informal economy is, is very significant. And again, it's a very female intensive um, sector. 73% of, of Peruvians are located in the, in the informal economy or, or were pre-COVID, but women are much more likely to have um, informal work compared to men. So again, this has very significant implications in terms of what access and entitlements they have in terms of healthcare services and, um, and, and again, while um, basic services are available to them and they are able to access certain, um, uh, certain treatments required as a consequence of COVID, it doesn't mean to say that there aren't other ways in which, you know, more informal mechanisms that constrain their access to the healthcare system. Um, and as I've said already, women are much more likely to be uh, located in, in the cis health sector, so the um, social insurance, which again is incredibly underfunded compared to other parts of the sector, and there's not necessarily access to ventilators, etc. And there's no, um, there's no, it, it's not as if people in, in the cis sector can then suddenly access a private hospital where there's a ventilator that just is not feasible in the Peruvian case so again this is where the fragmentation of the system is very significant and does arguably have gendered impacts. Um, we know that uh, lockdown has meant key economic activities with female intensive service sectors are, are hardest hit so again the, the service sector where uh, high numbers of women are located so again, this raises questions about their ability to generate income and their ability to pay for healthy food or whatever. But more significantly in relation to health, it, it's important because of out of pocket expenditure. So the cost of medicine, the cost of um, other health inputs that you might need, people might be charged for clean sheets for their stay in hospital, et cetera, et cetera. These are all um, included in, in debates around um, out of pocket expenditure. Um, and there's there's discussion that sorry there's the it's important to think about um, other aspects of health expenditure in terms of cost of transport to hospital etc cetera, etc cetera. but the data we have shows that um, women pay higher levels of um, out of pocket expenditure than men so if women are those that are losing their job those that are taking on more unpaid care work what does this mean for their ability to pay for um, health related expenditure, which in the context of COVID is, is likely to significantly increase. So clearly, um, there are suggestions that the financial burden of COVID is impacting women much more heavily than men. Um, and of, again, their indirect health costs, there's been evidence from Peru that um, other over the counter pharmaceutical products are rising, there's a differential price structure for things like face masks, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So all of these costs need to um, be considered and, and the gendered impacts of pain for these is, is important.
And uh, next slide, please. So just really to um, finish, yeah, I think it's important that there's a greater solidarity and coordination across the region in terms of responses to COVID from a gender perspective and, and thinking about you know, health in, in this context. It's important that we uh, recognize and acknowledge that health systems are gendered structures and that we need to think about gender beyond just the kind of immediate response to, to COVID in terms of you know, who is more vulnerable, women or men, but think much more broadly. And also consider the, as well as the gender, the racialized impacts of COVID on households and to recognize them as both producers and consumers of health. So I will finish there, thank you. Many thanks, Jasmine. That's a fascinating case study in itself, really, of, of Peru. I, I suppose I'm just wondering, um, given all your in-depth knowledge about Peru and, and relating it to the uh, UN tracker, um, uh, and they were speculating, Constance and Zilka was speculating at the end about um, why there might be stronger responses in some countries than others. Well, first of all, did Peru um, have a relatively strong or relatively weak response in, in terms of policy sensitivity um, to gender? Um, and it, depending on your answer to that, how, how would you explain that given your knowledge of, of the Peruvian health system? Mm. So it's a big question, Look, but it is. <laughs> and <laughs> maybe there's kidding. other people in the audience who are better placed to answer. I mean, I would say that in terms of um, response, they, they, you know, the Peruvian government did respond um, rapidly. Lockdown was announced pretty quickly. Um, there were there were measures put in place in terms of social protection, etc. Um, but I think. Uh, yes, we, we know that it's still one of the countries that have, has had highest um, death rates and highest rates of infection. And I, um, I, I don't know so much about the kind of broader gender dimensions. I mean, again, I know that, um, that uh, levels of gender-based violence are incredibly high um, and, and, um, and, and those issues, the, the kind of issues raised by um, Constance and, and, and uh, Silke. In terms of kind of, I, I don't think there's been much thought given to the gender dimensions of the health system in terms of the response. And I think one of the, um, the, the problems, and I've kind of uh, hinted at it, is this, this fragmentation and segmentation of the health system that, that it's, that it's not been possible to kind of coordinate initiatives across the different parts of the health sector. So that while you might have ventilators or labs, if they're located in the private sector, they're not able to, that knowledge and expertise um, and resources don't feed into the public sector. So there's been this very kind of constrained response because there hasn't been a coordinated response across the health system. Mm -hmm. And so you, yeah, so I think this is one of the big things. And this, this work comes out of a project I've been working on with several colleagues in Peru. And I think what we've argued uh, uh, is that because so much attention was given to meeting the SDGs and um, ensuring universal access, which has happened arguably through the CIS, but uh, it, it's only access to certain kinds of services. And again, it doesn't really address issues like the quality of care and the marginalization of um, indigenous women, for example, that, that, you know, those kind of informal barriers that people face mm. in terms of accessing care haven't been taken into account. And, and I suppose they're the kind of things that are not necessarily captured in the data. So again, I suppose that raises questions which I think Silke did allude to, you know, in terms of having a tracker, you know, what gets missed and what, you know, what hides behind the data, what kinds of inequalities are there? Because again, Peru scores quite well on health indicators, but um, I think, yeah, they, they do hide a lot of inequalities um, within the country, particular, particularly the, the rural urban um, inequalities and the way that yeah, indigenous women are highly marginalized within, you know, even within the rural, rural versus urban divide. Mm. 
Right. I suspect that that last very good point of yours about all these informal barriers and what a tracker can't pick up is going to come up in the next uh, yeah, country yeah. case study. So yeah. I, I don't see any other questions in the chat line at the moment. So I guess everyone's saving them up for the end. So many thanks, Jasmine, a fascinating presentation. So we'll turn now to uh, three country case studies, um, starting off with Brazil. Uh, and this is going to be presented by Bila Sorge, who is a full professor at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. So Bila, over to you. Bila? Unmute. You're muted at the moment. Okay, if you... okay. thank you very much for the <laughs> There you are, great. <laughs> to participate in this very interesting and important event. I think I'm not able to answer the question Silk raised, but I suppose I can indicate some clues. I focus my talk uh, on the emergency ed program, which is a cash transfer program aiming at tackling this, the disruptive economic effect of the pandemic on the most vulnerable part of the population. The program directly affected women because they are overrepresented in the vulnerable segment and because some of its measures are directly gender sensitive. I will comment on the program and the role played by grassroots organization and NGOs in mitigating many difficulties that women in particular had to face with uh, its design, the, the program design. But first of all, I will place the pandemic in the Brazilian political context of an extreme right government. In recent decades, women's rights, gender equality, and sexual diversity agenda, despite limits and ambiguities, had been greatly strengthened in Brazil. But the arrival of an ultra-right ultra government with strong support from conservative wings of the church represent a huge setback in, the, in this historical process. In his inauguration speech, Bolsonaro states that combating, this, that combating the gender ideology will be among his priorities. The sexual and the gender ad agenda uh, was resignified by government officer as part of strengthening a naturalized notion of family, gender, and its hierarchies. The category of family as a safe space in the face of social and economic instability is often mobilized by the government discourse. Uh, it is in this political scenario that the health crisis emerge. The president repose was negationist, minimizing its seriousness and combating social isolation. Using a misogynist vocabulary, he enforced stigmas and justified domestic violence. Commenting on the increase of gender violence, he state, I quote, uh, there is, a women, uh, there is uh, women being be be beaten at home. Why is this? At home, there is a lack of bread. Everyone fights and nobody is right. How does it end? You have to work, my God in heavens. It is a crime to work. To uh, neutralize the present irresponsible attitude, the Supreme Court, Court granted that decision on social isolation, like suspension of schools activity, stores closure, cultural and sports activity, among others, should be taken at state and municipal levels. The fear of a social upheaval, and in order to stimulate the economy, the Ministry of Economy created an emergency aid program. Bolsonaro said to limit the amount to be received by the beneficiary, but the Congress pushed it to a much higher level. In fact, the emergency ad became a pragmatic opportunity to the president to increase his popularity, particularly in the north and northeast of the country, the strongholds of the Workers' Party. 
Unlike the Bolsa Familia program, which targeted the population in extreme poverty, the emergency aid included informal workers, unemployed, autonomous, and micro entrepreneurs. Around 30 million Brazilian households, that is 43% of the total, received the emergency aid in June. Uh, it is an important increase in uh, Bolsa Familia coverture which target around 40% of the household in 2019. Almost half of Brazilian population lives in household with, in which at least one person has received the emergency head. The criteria to, to apply to the emergency head include to be at least 18 years old, except for adolescent mothers to whom there is no age, age limit, and having not as no access to other social security benefits, except for the Bolsa Familia. For those who received the Bolsa Familia, it was given the option to be transferred to the new program. This is extremely advantageous since the emergency aid value is three times higher than the average monthly payment of the Bolsa Familia. There is also an income threshold to apply for the aid. The family per capita income should be up to half minimum wage and a totally family income up to three minimum wages. Only two people per family over 18 years old can receive the benefit. Emergency aid is a gender and maternity sensitive program not in the sense of Bolsa Familia, where mother, head of family with children had preference to receive the payment, but in terms of the amount received. Even mother heads of the household under 18 years old receive twice the amount. In this sense, the ad is pro-women, pro-mother and pro-child as well. Initially, it was planned to provide three monthly installment of 600 reais, that is around uh, $110. However, in July, a fourth and fifth installment were authorized. On September, the federal government announced the payment of four more installment, but have the value to 300 reais until the, the end of 2020. What will come after that is not yet known, but several proposals are under discussion for 2021. One of the most remarkable results of the emergency aid was the significant reduction of poverty and social inequality that reached its lowest historical level. Without the aid, it is estimated that the economic crisis caused by the pandemic would compromise all the redistributive effort of the last 25 years. I will comment briefly on some problems that the eligible candidates, especially women, confronted during the implementation of the program, which reveals other dimensions of social inequalities. The first one is that the only way to receive the ad was through online inscriptions. It became clear that digital inclusion, not only the access, but also the ability to effectively use ICTs is still a challenge in Brazil. In 2019, 74 of Brazilians make effective use of internet. And this number is a bit higher among men. Among the illiterate, however, only 16% had access to internet. Among, among those earning less than a minimum wage, the level of access is 61%. The second question is that a large part of the population do not have bank accounts. Unbanked people represent 20% uh, of Brazilian adult population. They are, for the most part, the poorest population, women and Black people. In the face of this shortage, the, go the federal government had to make cash withdrawal possible. But the result was the opposite of what was intended with the isolation policy. Crowds of people uh, piled up in long queues 
at bank branches. Women need to leave their children, when feasible, under the care of others and endure the displacement and long waiting time, subjecting to contracting COVID. Third, Many women did suffer moral and physical violence for questioning the children's father for misusing the documents of their children. Many fathers register their children with whom they do not cohabit as members of their household in order to decrease their per capita income away to defraud the system. So mothers were not able to receive the aid with the double amount. Many fathers as well fail to pay alimony under the argument that the women will receive emergency aid in double and therefore they are exempted from this obligation. A variety of cultural, social and religious grassroots organizations and NGO composed mainly by women had an important role in supporting residents in community to remotely filling out the electronic register, the distribution of basic food baskets, sanitation kits, monitoring the disease and mortality, making and distributing homemade masks, socializing information and making pressure on the state as well. In some cities like Sao Paulo, government created a basic income program for street vendors. This experience reveals the potential for collective action in these territories. To finalize, let me say that besides the huge impact in reducing poverty and social inequality, the emergency aid raised the discussion on social inequality to a new level. It fostered a public debate on the need to create a permanent basic income program in the country. This proposal, until now voiced only by groups with limited representation, had gained great political support. In July, the Congress launched a parliamentary network in the face uh, in defense of basic income. More than one third of the total members of the Congress participating in it. It mobilized as well the civil society. The movement called the basic income we want counted with more counts with more than 250 civil society organizations and has been campaigning for the implementation of a permanent basic income program. The future of this debate and the design of this proposal uh, we have uh, will have obviously um, depends, let's say, on political forces, interests, and pressures from different groups. The future of a more inclusive social policy to reduce poverty and inequality is still open in Brazil. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Vila. <laughs> Fascinating discussion of Brazil. Thank you. Well, again, I see no questions appearing in the chat line. So I think let us um, turn to our next case study, which is on Argentina. And I'd like to invite Eleanor Farr, who is a professor at the National University of San Martin in Argentina, to talk to you about that. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for this invitation. I feel very honored to share this webinar with some very nice uh, professors and colleagues of my, I mean, in my personal history. So my presentation will focus on some other actors, I mean, alternative actors out uh, from the state government policies and especially on grass, grassroots organization and women working at community uh, care sector, I would call it like that. So in Argentina, as in most of the region, the deterioration of the population living conditions was a process that preceded the pandemic, but it was intensified in the context of COVID-19. According to UNICEF, since the isolation measures were taken, 60% of households saw their income decreased 
the loss of incomes was higher for those who received cash transfer, that is the most vulnerable population. The Argentinian government reacted very rapidly in search of protect jobs, incomes, and food securities, uh, both for formal employees and for vulnerable population. According to the UN Gender Tracker, 44 measures were put in place very rapidly, as I said, and most of them were gender sensitive. This has uh, this relates not only to the uh, socio-democratic government that took over in December 2019, but also with a lot of women and feminist women taking part into the new government. Uh, however, although 35% of all households received some sort of income or crash transfer or other food support mechanism, almost half of poor households stopped consuming certain foods during these periods. Now, who sustained the critical situation of the, of the low income sectors? Uh, as in many other cases that a uh, crisis that we previously had, women from communities sustain all this uh, crisis through grassroots work. Let me share with you uh, some, recent, some uh, findings of a recent study that I made together with Karina Brovelli for UNDP, ECLAC, and the Ministry of Women, Gender, and Diversity. So in this study, we look at two sectors of community care. One was childhood development centers, and the other one was community eateries or kitchens. So both are mainly run by women who sustain the well-being of members and households of the communities of which these women are usually part. These sectors uh, are normally treated as homogeneous. However, uh, they are two very particular phases within the wide world of community care. Uh, regarding childhood centers, they mix uh, education and care provision uh, through, through popular pedagogies like uh, Paulo Freire's and so on. They aim to promote the development and rights of the children they, they attend and uh, to kind of prevent the intergenerational uh, reproduction of poverty. Uh, as for the eateries, they work uh, in the immediacy, supporting the mere subsistence of the population. They both have different paths, experiences, capacities, and knowledge. Now, during the COVID crisis, community crashes could not receive children, so they focus in the sustainability of food security, pedagogical continuity, and social bonds. Meanwhile, their workers had to take care of their own health, of course, so they organized work shifts that accepted uh, those who are most vulnerable uh, from attending. Uh, food was guaranteed not only for registered children and adolescents, but also for their families, and even for people for, from the neighborhood without prior contact with the centers. In the case of community kitchens, kitchens, the deterioration of the social situation quickly impacted the access to food of many households, as I said before. So this resulted in the multiplication of demand for these eateries. Uh, there was not only an increase of the demand, but also a change in the profile of this demand. Neighbors who had never requested food assistance before, and especially older people, began to attend. As in the case of community crashes, eateries workers also implement protocols to take care of their own health. And unlike the, cases, the case of crashes, in the case of kitchens, the national government increased 40% of budget uh, for them. This was not the case in the in the community uh, crashes. Now, it is clear that some dimensions of care work uh, for both of these sectors can be perceived and accounted. I mean, there, there was a, a huge increase of the care work that these women uh, was, had to do, as in many other crises before, but this was particular because they were also afraid of their health uh, security, of course. 
Uh, but now there are some other uh, dimensions of the care that they sustain, that they provide, that were quite invisible almost for them and even dif difficult to measure. This is the case uh, with what we call like a, a community and direct care. This is a category that we usually use for household work, for unpaid uh, care in households, but uh, we didn't take it for, I mean, maybe we took it for granted in community care. Uh, now, there was a huge increase of this in indirect care, that is looking for prices, trying to um, manage new resources with the government, taking, I mean, trying to, we say, like expand the resources to feed more and more people, et cetera, et cetera. And there are also some other dimensions of care work that are also imperceptible. That is the emotional care that they produce, uh, that was produced by community care workers in, in a period that many of the population around was very anxious and sad and, I mean, with a lot of uh, conflict over there, even an increase in violence against women, they reported. Now, in both cases, both in kitchens and in crashes, we found a significant increase of all these dimensions, direct care and direct care and emotional care. All in all, the work carried out by women in childhood centers and eateries was uh, central to the sustained subsistence of vulnerable population and their bonds. Although in the three, last three decades, the state has made progress in financing these spaces, uh, they were not able to recognize still the care work necessary for their operation. And this was particularly clear during the COVID crisis. So the financing of the community kitchens and creches is still intended solely for the purchase of supplies or equipment, but not for the payment of salaries for these care workers. So they, they, they accede to some, uh, some kind of resources that are, is, they are called incentives. This is a language of the neoliberal policies during the 90s that still remains in our in the uh, grassroots work in Argentina. Okay, I'm wrapping up. So the question now that emerges is once again, uh, up to what extent are these women, as Maxime Molina uh, stated some years ago, at the service of the state, or who will care for the economic security of community care workers. That's all. Thank you very much. Great. That was so interesting. Thank you very much, Eleanor. Wonderful. And then now we move to our final speaker um, talking to us about what happened in Chile, um, Paula Giron from the University of Chile, where she's an associate professor there. Paula. Thank you, Nicola, and thank you for the invitation. Um, it, it's quite a challenge to, to present all that's been happening um, in Chile over the past few months. Um, I have a PowerPoint presentation. I hope you can see it. Um, so uh, what we, we've called it is a pandemic and gender inequalities in Chile towards the caring territories. I think it's very important to understand what's been happening in Chile over the past year. Since October last year, we've had um, quite an important um, um, outrage and uh, um, social outrest, outrest by, due to different um, uh, complaints in society over the, the lack of, um, of the, the possibilities of macroeconomic success and how these successes don't reach the overall population. Uh, so people demanding better pensions, salaries, health, education, housing, transport, a lot of gender inequalities and a lot of um, repression has been going on and respect for human rights. So in the context of a lot of um, social outrest by a Chilean population, we, um, we reach the, the pandemic in, in quite a weak 
situation in terms of government support and what's been happening in the country. Uh, the positive part of the of the outbreak was that um, many of the organizations that were pre previously um, dismembered began to to take uh, to join again. Um, so uh, pandemic exacerbates the existing inequality that we have, despite Chile being a country that is seen as quite successful uh, within the, the region. Um, what we see is that COVID has um, had a very negative impact on di different dimensions of women's everyday life, including isolation, violence, working hours, employment, care work, and psychosocial conditions overall. Um, we're currently in Chile with just approved the possibility of changing our constitution. Um, so there's a lot of discussion going on in the country that has to do with how do we change, um, how do we change our constitutions? How do we improve uh, society? Uh, and how do we reach the right of care? That's one of the things that we would like to look at. Um, so there have been a lot of uh, measures and policies that have been implemented uh, in terms of pre and postnatal permission extension, uh, flexibility for remote work for public servants, for instance, uh, food provision in certain uh, public establishments, the delivery of, of food boxes in lower income areas, credit facilities for micro enterprises, minimal and emergency income programs, um, employment insurance reinforcement and some rental housing subsidies. However, these different measures um, did not reach the population uh, very adequately. Um, for instance, we have these uh, images of food dis boxes distribution. It took a lot of time. They came quite late. They came um, in around July, August, uh, and it took a long time for these boxes to be delivered individually. And this, in terms of what's happening in Chile, the, these kind of measures seem to be quite paternalistic and assistentialistic um, towards uh, population. Um, in terms of care, what we saw was um, increase in care work during the pandemic. Uh, the different surveys that have been taken during pandemic because 63% of, of people mentioned an increase in time in care chores. Um, there's an echo. Um, I'm sorry. Um, among those declaring care chores, women increased their care work in greater pr pr proportion than men uh, in 58%. 22% of women increased their care work um, of 8% um, versus 30% of men. Um, and 37% of men who do undertake care chores mentioned that they did not have an increase in their care chores versus 28% of women. Um, so we see that women are um, predominant caregivers within this pandemic. Um, and there's been an increase uh, in, in, although men have taken care of certain um, activities, it is women that are, have been uh, doing uh, most of the activities that have to do with taking care of children, uh, cooking, cleaning, washing up, and, uh, and uh, looking at the needs of children in general. Um, we see uh, we saw an increase in the calls and attentions for violence towards women and starting from March there was an increase in 125% of calls for orientation towards violence, uh, increasing anxiety and stress due to confinement, greatly mainly by women and increase in unemployment for women and men. Chile experience uh, is it, we currently have 30% of informal employment. And what we saw is was that because we have this uh, large number of people that work in the informal sector, um, people have to continue moving despite the lockdown measures. So what we see here in this map, the this area here are where higher income groups are located. Uh, and that's where um, effective lo lockdown took place. But in the rest of the city, this is the city of Santiago, what we saw was that people had to continue moving mainly people with um, more um, precarious uh, contracts and employment. So although we did have quite strict measures of lockdown, what we effectively saw was that there were a lot of people that continued to move throughout the city. And you could see uh, we carried out various um, virtual ethnographies during this time. We saw a lot of people moving and therefore a lot of people getting sick. What we also saw was that because the measures that were implemented by the government were not uh, prompt uh, in terms of in times, what we started seeing was communal pots of food. That, that's very common in Chile and they took place and, and throughout Latin America, but these took place during dictatorship in Chile and they, there was a revival during this time. Um, so we had um, over 400 of these 
communal parts within the country, uh, and also all the gathering points uh, where food and, and basic goods were gathered um, by the communities and the communal organizations and community organizations throughout the country. Um, so we started seeing measures that were supported by communities um, and where the government had no uh, role, basic role in it. Uh, so we started seeing things that we had not seen before in, in for at least 30 years in our country, um, in various places, uh, in various cities and in various ways, and mainly women taking care of these communal pots um, throughout the country. Um, and this generated a, a big um, outrage as well by, by uh, citizens in Chile. In, in the midst of, of what was going on, that people in Chile are no longer happy with the um, economic system. So we started seeing that we were facing hunger by a country that cannot be having hunger at this time. Uh, and a lot of uprising due to hunger due to inadequate measures. Um, and if the virus doesn't, um, doesn't kill us, then hunger will. This is what the sign says. And also many of the measures that were implemented were privatized or were done by private companies or private measures that individuals had to uh, resolve on their own. Unemployment insurance was financed by the, prop the own workers. So what we saw in terms of the measures that were implemented, and I think it's quite useful to see the, 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 the tracking system, uh, the tracker that actually informs what types of measures were implemented or were planned, but not necessarily the way they were implemented. The measures were austere, uh, despite the possibilities that Chile has in terms of funding, there was a mere relocation of funds. There wasn't a, a lot of much more extra funding put in place in all the measures that were implemented. They were insufficient to the, to the amount of unemployment and hunger that was currently taking place. They were late. Um, many of them started being implemented two or three or four months after the pandemic started. They were cumbersome in terms of implementation, as, as they were mentioned in the case of Brazil. Um, they required uh, people having accounts and internet and, and, and people had to go to the places to, for, for many of the measures to start being uh, taking place. Uh, they were uncoordinated. Um, the health measures were not really coordinated uh, with, the, with the transport measures, uh, or uh, many, many of these um, were not localized with, um, with the districts uh, where the people lived. They were deterritorialized, meaning that many of the measures were seen basically from a health perspective or an economic perspective, and not necessarily related to where people were actually living and how they were living on an everyday basis. They were also centralized. They were all the measures were were taken in Santiago and not um, uh, throughout the country. They were individualized, meaning that many of the measures were catered towards individuals and not towards communities. Um, and that meant that many of the measures that actually did work had to be um, brought about by by communities themselves. Um, and they were also targeted to those that were employed and not to the unemployed or those that were. Um, uh, self-employed or in the informal sector. So the government had um, centered on self-care and lockdowns were implemented on an individual, individual approach and not collectively. Uh, there was an incapacity to visualize the consequence of the implemented policies on an everyday basis on women. Uh, schools were closed um, and that meant uh, that women particularly had to take care of children and on all the issues uh, meaning uh, had, that had to do with violence, uh, sexual and reproductive rights, inter interruption of resources and uh, social and family and community networks were completely closed down and mental health issues were not addressed until much later um, in, in, in the pandemic. There was an absence of support toward collective initiatives, uh, something that historically had been very relevant in Chile um, were completely ignored. Um, and there was an absence in participation in design and implementation of measures, uh, meaning that the state ha had ignored the suggestions from national inter and international organisms to incorporate gender approaches to sanitary response. Uh, what we had was uh, an individual response. For instance, we were able to um, access our pension funds uh, and remove uh, at the first time 10% of our pension funds uh, in order to, um, to, to access or to, to be able to, to deal with the crisis. Uh, in terms of, of collective care, 
um, what we saw was that it was individual and, and collective actions have been identified in the context of crisis. Some organizations created during this social outbreak that, that I mentioned in 2019 were later reoriented uh, during pandemic. So many of the groups that were um, formed um, using their WhatsApp um, application were able to coordinate a lot of the food provision and care um, in, in collective and community areas, um, including gathering and distribution of food and other basic items, popular pots, purchasing together, um, taking care of the elderly and their medications um, and different community support in precarious conditions. Um, so what, what we see um, is, is the need uh, in order to incorporate and, and strengthen the needs and the, and the rights of women, particularly in terms of care and sustaining life um, to establish the rights of care. This is in the context that during the following year, we will be elaborating a new constitution in Chile. So most of these issues are things that we want to be present in the discussion of what's happening, uh, will be happening in Chile in terms of basic universal income uh, for caretakers and pension mechanisms, intergenerational education in matters of care, public policies that are designed for diverse care situations, um, the management and supervision of national care plans, uh, short-term measures in terms of uh, at least having a national survey of the people that are dependent in dependency situations, um, uh, and also uh, for caretakers, short-term uh, short uh, caretaking, um, implementing mental and physical health programs, training in care and promoting rights approach and autonomy for persons under dependency. So what we also saw was a complete elimination of territories that care or cities and the way that cities could be part uh, or territories could be part of this um, reproduction of life. So the elements that we think that have to be paramount in terms of care uh, in the next wave of, of pandemic that we will be reaching in the following months, at least in the Southern Cone, um, is how do we incorporate other practices of care, not just the care of children, but, but other practices of care that have to do with the production of life uh, in terms of food provision, for instance, um, uh, or, or recycling or garbage disposal. Um, what, what are the places of care that we need to start looking at, the materiality of care um, on how people are able to, to, to move about the city and the various subjects of care and how do we start looking at mobility of care and, and the consequences of the large proportion of population that will continue to move um, during the, the following year uh, while this pandemic is taking place. Um, so what we'd like to think about for the future is how to continue uh, positioning care as a work that needs to be paid for and as a social right. How do we start thinking of a, of a creation of a universal care system uh, similar to what's happening in other countries like Uruguay, for instance. Um, how to deepen policies that strengthen care actions um, oriented towards community and social fabric versus this individual way that uh, Chilean government is looking at, 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 at uh, solutions or at, at measures for COVID um, and prioritizing care issues for the reproduction of life above economic growth. Most of the measures have either been um, very post um, sick people uh, oriented to, towards people that are already sick and towards promoting economic growth and not necessarily about taking care of its population. Um, and we see the need to, to, to really incorporate a multi-sectoral approach and not just having each sector work individually and also how to territorialize care. Um, so those are the issues that are happening in Chile. I think the, the future in terms of our constitution and how this whole discussion will come about is quite important uh, and how women and care issues have to be put, put in the center of the discussion in our country. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Paolo. It's a wonderfully complex situation, but you've summarized it for us beautifully. Thank you. Um, what, so we do have some time left for questions, if those of you would like to, to stay on a bit. Um, and I still, the invitation is open to, to put them in the chat. One question that's come up from one of the members of the audience. Um, she's wondering how the gender tracker can include issues of implementation and effectiveness. 
Um, and that possibly could make it an even more powerful tool of transformative social change, she's suggesting. So perhaps uh, Constanza or Zilke, first of all, you'd like to respond to that, that question about whether you think it's possible um, to try and monitor effectiveness. Hi, Zilke. Is Zilke there? Yes, yes. She's on my oh, screen. Okay, okay. Yes, she's there. Okay, yes. I was wondering if you wanted to take this one because I took the other one. So I, I'm happy to do it as well. But, you know, feel free. Okay. Um, sure. No, go ahead. Go ahead. And I can add if there's anything to add. Okay. okay. Perfect. So thank you, Jelke, for that question. That is something we we are grappling with uh, at present, obviously, because it's a global tracker and we are a limited team. There's so much we can do with little, with the little information available, but we are thinking of adding two um, implementation related um, new kind of columns of information to the next updates of the tracker. The tracker will be updated quarterly, so we will have a next update at the beginning of January, where we are planning to include some information on where available the budget allocated to measures, gender sensitive measures, as well as some idea. I mean, either we, I mean, we are playing with two different ideas, either if we can get a hold of the date of um, announcement and implementation to have that mirror over time. But if, if not, we will try and have the information at least which measures were announced, which measures were implemented, and what is particularly important for us as well is which measures have been discontinued. Uh, because we also are wary that, in a way, our tracker tracks new policy developments, but doesn't track so much um, those are discontinued or reversals, policy reversals. So that's one of the issues we are trying to grapple with at present. And so okay, you can add if you want. And maybe just to add um, a couple of other points that are related to the methodology and you know that we try to stress. So obviously we do look at number of measures and number, sheer number is not everything. So one, one aspect um, I think that requires nuancing is the whole question of implementation and impact, but also, you know, the measures can be of very different scope. You know, we can have a massive scale up like the cash transfer program that um, Bila spoke about in Brazil compared to a helpline um, for domestic violence victims in, in a different context. So that's also something to keep in mind and to look at. Um, as Connie said, we've thought about kind of adding some more information that hints at implementation, but I think it's important to keep in mind that this global tracker is quite a blunt tool. And there are real limitations to what can be done with the tracker. I do think it fulfills an important function, in particular in showing you know, some of the real gaps, even at the policy design level. Um, but I think it's more than anything a starting point for the kind of conversations that we're having today, and which you know, makes it so important to have more qualitative analysis complementing this, this quantification of measures. So things like, you know, the ones that Bila told us about, about the unintended consequences of some of these um, measures when they're implemented, like fathers staking claims on transfers for children that they don't cohabit with and so on, is, is just something that I think is very difficult to, um, for a global tracker to accommodate. But um, I think we're definitely going to keep our eyes and ears open. And if people have ideas, and we'll also be looking for kind of doing some further case studies to kind of nuance and look at some of the complexities and, and how they play out on the ground. And I think we've had some really good ideas um, today already. Great, thanks. Um, in, in it, Yvette Hernandez has effectively two questions. Let's first of all take her specific question to Paula. Paula, Yvette asks, um, if you could develop a little bit more your concept of territorializing care. Yes, um, it has to do with the way where is our care activities taking place. 
Uh, they don't always take place or only take place at home, but they take place, uh, I mean, in order for us to take our children to school or in order to, to go to, to do any of the activities of, of care, we have to move about the city. And most of the time, these activities are, or, or care issues are placeless, are not um, specific uh, on to where these uh, are taking place. With what happened in terms of, of COVID, most of the, they thought that the virus wasn't moving and the virus moves along with people. So while people were moving, the virus was being transmitted. Uh, and um, if the measures were only for people to stay put and they didn't recognize that we need to go shopping for food, we need to do, go to the hospital, we need to move around, then all the issues of care are not taken care of. Um, so what we see is that not only do we have to broaden what care activities are, which is not just taking care of children or the elderly or the sick, but also things that enable us to reproduce life. But also, where do these activities take place? Uh, in order for me to take my child to school, I have to walk, I have to take the bus, I have to move about different places. And the qualities of those spaces are quite important. I mean, I work at the Faculty of Architecture and Urbanism, so those are the issues that we look at. How do we emplace um, all the practices of care, and just and not and, and I don't think it's enough to pay for care work, but to actually socialize it and to make it common, uh, to, to make it um, social, to make it for different people to have to take care of it. It's not just women that have to take care of it, but everyone that's involved around care issues. Um, so I think there's a lot to be looked at in terms of the role that cities play uh, in terms of improving care conditions for women. You were mute, Nicola. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what I was saying <laughs> was that it, it uh, just following on from what you were, you were saying there, Paula, which I think is very interesting. It, it's almost like policy makers are looking in the wrong places when they when they they're, they're kind of designing their policies, or at least the situation on the ground is so complex and moving so fast that it's very difficult to kind of know how to to target policies and they're still thinking in units such as the household which are perhaps not really where a lot of the, um, the key processes are happening. Anyway, um, let's move on to Yvette's broader question which is a very interesting question about how um, different um, gender oriented um, policies in response to COVID-19, how they articulate or not with grassroots feminist collective action. So I don't know, perhaps um, um, Eleanor, I think perhaps that that responds particularly well to the kind of things you were talking about in Argentina. Perhaps you'd like to respond to that one first. Well, thank you. Well, actually, I, I, I'm not sure that there was a, a good match between women's collective action and the responses that government did in the case of Argentina. Uh, nowadays, well, just in a few points nowadays this year, that is very, very important, but it's not really related to COVID-19. And I'm talking about the abortion law. We had a very enthusiastic movement and huge movement of uh, that was aiming to make abortion legal uh, in all cases uh, for women in, in the country. You know that there are many, uh, few, few countries that has uh, legal abortion in Latin America, and that's Uruguay, Cuba, the city of Mexico, and Guyana, I think. So, uh, but in the context with, of COVID, the president what had committed to uh, present a project on abortion right, and, and he, I mean, it, it we had some few some times that it, it looks as if COVID was, I mean, took over this whole situation and this project was not going to be presented. But uh, last week, uh, the president presented this, uh, this project to the Congress. So we have a very good uh, new around that. I mean, it's not discussed uh, yet. It hasn't been discussed yet, but maybe we have good news around that. But in the uh, in, in the cases that I analyzed, uh, 
that was on community care. Uh, actually, there was some uh, some advocacy movement of of the of the proper women. Uh, that was taking care, for instance, in the crashes on projects of law to recognize their work and social security and social protection. But this was, was not, uh, still it's not uh, recovered by the government. So I think there's a kind of parallel uh, action between government and community uh, women in this case of economic security, but not in social, sexual and reproductive, reproductive rights, uh, luckily. And also in violence against women, we had good uh, examples of matching uh, agendas. Mm, very interesting. Would, would anybody else like to respond on that question? No? Okay, let's move on. Yes, may I say something? <laughs> yes, please do. <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> Mention here in this, uh, in our talk, is about the domestic workers. I think it is such a huge population that we have in Latin America and in Brazil, it is really, um, I think it was, it is in, all, in absolute terms the most. Uh, uh, huge workers that are in domestic uh, work, paid domestic work. Huh? And I think, uh, uh, I think it was very interesting because during this, uh, uh, the pandemic, uh, the domestic work, uh, uh, first, there were a, 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 a public discussion about it because the first person that was the dead, the, the died, died from the COVID was a domestic work. Uh, that uh, that uh, work in a middle class uh, family, and this middle class uh, came from uh, Europe and uh, contaminated those this um, domestic worker. She was the first one that uh, died on it. So I think all the, the, the issue about domestic works became a very important public issue uh, in Brazil. And the domestic workers organized themselves very well because um, mm. they, there were a debate about domestic workers. Are essential work or not? And in some states, there are uh, a law that said, uh, uh, a decree that said that domestic workers are essential work. And uh, it was about this, uh, the, by pressure of the, scene, the, the trade union of uh, the domestic work, this was uh, concealed. And they start a, a very interesting movement that that it's called essential are uh, our own rights, uh, essential our rights, not work. In some. So uh, I think it was a very important movement of domestic work that the crisis, the, the sanitary crisis uh, uh, provoke. And uh, they, they had a movement that was called Who Care for the Carers? So I think it's very, uh, it was really a very interesting phenomenon that uh, the domestic workers, the paid domestic workers, uh, became a public issue. Uh, they they sort out from this kind of invisibility that all the time they are uh, left, and uh, I think it was a public debate about them. I think, and uh, in fact, in Brazil they lost. Uh, uh, we have uh, one million, uh, six million domestic workers, and they, it's estimated that uh, one million and a half lost their job during the pandemic. So they were very hit by the, the, the sanitary crisis. And um, I think it's very interesting to, 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 to think about how this crisis provoke a public debate about something, about a, a, a group, a segment of the workers uh, and uh, completely genderized that was completely invisible in the public debate. I think this is on, on topic uh, that I think it is important. Another one uh, it, uh, about the, 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 the private uh, enterprises, how they uh, as well participate in this kind of involuntary action 
uh, in um, many in, in the favelas, in the community, uh, in the hospitals, uh, the new hospitals for uh, the COVID victims. I think it's important to, 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 to think about uh, how private capital as well participate in this uh, in this crisis. I think uh, it's important. I think to 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 monitor how what they did, how they uh, invest, how the what was the consequence, which kind of sector they they came. Because in, in Brazil it was very very important, very relevant. The uh, the the participation of. Uh, big enterprise, private capital, banks, and uh, very multinationals, uh, they were very active. So I think it, it's, it's, um, it's interesting to track how, what they did, what, uh, and how, where, who uh, were they. So uh, I think this. Okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Vila. You. Thanks very much. Some very interesting points there. And certainly we should think about private enterprises. Um, that's something that uh, resonates even very close to home. Um, well, I think we're coming to the end of our, our webinar now, but perhaps just one final question to, to pose to Zilka and Constanza, which uh, actually was raised by, by Maxine. I'm not sure everybody could see it, but the, the question of how important the political orientation of the regime is um, in, in determining um, gender sensitivity and policies. Is that one factor that you, with your overview perspective, would think is, is something that needs to be thought about? Silke, perhaps you'd like to take that one. Sure. I mean, I think it's definitely something that would be really interesting to look at. Um, we haven't done it yet. Again, I think it's something that will need to be looked at through comparative case studies more than any quantitative analyses. And I think what we hinted at in our presentation, you know, which is a hypothesis to explore, is that the ideological orientation of government does, of course, matter in some things, et cetera. But we also see, you know, really interesting responses in countries like Brazil um, and also Bolivia under the previous government, you know, implemented measures around violence, implemented some social protection measures. Mm. So is there also something to be set for, you know, policy legacies that, you know, and, and, and the, st the state and the government not being a monolith, you know, and either feminists still finding entry points and parts of the state to push certain agendas or, you know, Democrats or women in politics being able to build upon, you know, previously enacted policies and and political dynamics that they can mobilize um, in the pandemic. So I, I think you know it's a, it's a question to explore, but we see interesting things in the tracker that um, that we think are really worth looking at a bit um, a bit further. Thank you, Constanza. Did you want to add anything to that, or are you happy? You're happy with that? <laughs> okay. Well, there's a few other questions still coming up in the chat, but I think probably we ought to bring our event to a close now. And in many ways, the, the questions that did eventually start to come um, once everybody got going show really how wonderful a, a, a stimulus this tracker has been to to thinking about a very wide range of questions, I think. I mean, you, you described it, Silke or Constanza, I can't remember which, as a, as a blunt instrument, but in, in, in many ways, I think it's, it's not so much, I mean, I see what you mean, but there's a kind of clarity about what you've done that actually I think is really helpful for thinking about the, the wide range of other factors that, that are in play. Because, I mean, one thing that struck me in the discussions that all of you um, have, have been giving is, is that, of course, there's the gap. The, there's always the gap between policy and implementation. But the, the, the process of making policy, of discussing policy, of mobilizing for or against policy in itself seems to be something that's really very um, revealing about wider factors in the whole situation. And I find it actually in many ways um, inspiring that from some of the evidence that's come across it's the levels of, of community mobilization that seem to be another important factor in in thinking about these differential um, outcomes 
and and also I suppose another thing that that seems increasingly clear is that 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 in many cases governments are kind of missing the mark in where they target their policy but then there's a kind of community response that that is kind of pushing back and there's a so there's a a real dynamic there which offers I think some some hope for change despite all the the very difficult and and painful um, circumstances that we we know about um, so finally thank you so much to everybody I, it's been a hugely rich and enjoyable session um, and I'm sure your tracker Constance from Silva Silke will uh, stimulate many more um, such discussions and we thank you very much for all the wonderful work you did in it and we thank everybody for their responses um, and thanks to the audience for your questions thank you thank you thank you thank you nicola thank you everyone yeah. participant panelists be great uh, to have you all here <laughs> yeah, thanks to everyone really terrific thank you